today. Uh, thank you for taking the time to come and you know have this digital meeting. Obviously, I wish you could have this in person. I think it's always much better, obviously, to do it. But uh, do these this virus incident? It's a little bit tricky. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Georgina, for the um, the introduction. So yeah, just to give you a quick and a uh, little bit more uh, context into who I am, sort of what my journey in design has been. Um, yeah, I did start in you know I went to animation school at VFS here in Vancouver for the 2D course. Uh, I wanted to become an animator since I was pretty young. Always loved uh, cartoons and comics and just all sorts of different design stuff. Uh, I grew up watching the old Looney Tune, Hanna-Barbera stuff, and that's what I wanted to do. So, you know, I studied and went to school, graduated, and you know, got, my, got my jobs in the industry. Uh, I started doing ink and paint. I was an actual animator. I was a storyboard artist, character designer. I did layout. Uh, I worked on shows like Transformers Rescue Bots and Johnny Test and a couple others. Um, so it was really fun. Uh, but after a couple of years, I kind of learned that it wasn't really what I wanted to do. And uh, it's a volatile industry. There's lots of uh, ups and downs. So uh, I really wanted to kind of, you know, go into something that was a little bit more stable. And for me, that was, you know, staying in the in the art and design realm and that meant games. So, you know, I was. Uh, not a hardcore gamer, but I definitely enjoy my games and uh, decided to go into that realm. So I went and started to work at companies doing design. And because I had an illustration and animation background, I could draw and design pretty much anything. And, uh, you know, the needs were varied. Uh, sometimes they just wanted me to do boards, like storyboards and cinematics. Other times it was animation and motion graphics. And then sometimes it was just design, like uh, more graphic design kind of stuff. So. Uh, with all that background, it kind of led me to a really great place. And by the time um, mobile gaming took off around 2009, 2010, uh, I could use those skills to start in uh, incorporating my designs, things like UI and some UX. And that's kind of where I started. And then I kind of kept that ball rolling by working at other companies, working on uh, mobile games for clients like the NFL and Hasbro. So I worked on a G.I. Joe game. I worked on an NFL football game, uh, did some original games, uh, transitioned and moved into console gaming. I worked as a UI artist on Halo, the Master Chief collection for Xbox One. Um, and then I moved into doing more educational games for, for schools and for uh, smaller startup companies here in, in Vancouver. Uh, and after that point decided that, hey, you know, I, I kind of want to move into even bigger realm of, of work and decided to work for more enterprise and uh, SaaS related companies. And, and SaaS just stands for software as service. Uh, so basically anything that you can kind of um, purchase and use and it has uh, various abilities that's kind of considered a SaaS uh, service. So yeah, I worked in all this and it kind of led me to my journey here today at Cycle, which is goes back to kind of my belief with, you know, combining my passion for design and making things uh, work. It's also to fix people's problems, you know, make sure that people have great user experiences and digital experiences with products, but also products that, you know, matter to people's lives. And they're not just, uh, you know, gimmicky or flaky or something like that. It's actually making a positive change in the way people uh, work in the world and, and help other people. Uh, I didn't want to work for a company that's just a, you know, making a chat bot or something like that. I actually wanted to make a difference. So uh, Cycle is, you know, uh, which I'll get into in, in a little bit in more detail, but yeah, it, it kind of um, was a great journey for me. So um, yeah, I'm, you know, along the way, I, I'd love to give back. And uh, I was an educator myself for a number of years at uh, another school here in Vancouver. So it's great to be able to talk to you guys today and kind of share some of those experiences. And I you know, being a student, you know, over a decade ago myself, I could, you know, I still know a lot of that hardship and that feeling of anxiety and, and all that as well. And um, another reason why I wanted to share my background with you as well is to also show you that you can transition and it doesn't mean that you made one decision at one choice that you're stuck with it forever. Uh, you can definitely move between industries. Your skills are transferable. And I think that's a very understated thing that a lot of people are not aware of is that you really do have these skills that are more than just oh, I can just make a flyer. It's like, yeah, but you can make a web page. You can also make animations and motion graphics. Like you have all these skills ready. You just need to know how to apply them and how to, how to make use of them. And it does take time, but uh, a little patience and luck and some hard work uh, definitely goes a long way. Um, so yeah, um, basically what I'm gonna do and kind of the layout for this presentation is I'm gonna go into, I got a little bit of a slide uh, that I wanna share with you guys. And then 
Um, at the end of it, I'm totally opening it up to Q and A. Uh, if something's on your mind or you have a question about something, whether it's uh, what I'm talking about in terms of, of work or how things uh, are in the industry, uh, feel free to ask. More than happy to accommodate at that point. Um, and then, yeah, if anyone has any trouble hearing me or I'm speaking too fast, please do speak up, and I'll be conscious to uh, you know slow down and, and uh, wait for people. But without fur further ado, let me uh, share my screen here and get going with our uh, presentation. So yeah, um, so today we're, I'm just going to go over cycle, and as was mentioned, basically. Um, I'm also going to go into the UX and design here at Cycle, kind of how we approach it. Um, and with that sort of being said, uh, so who is Cycle? So it was uh, mentioned a little bit briefly before, but basically yeah, we're, uh, we have our, our software service that's uh, a platform for audiologists. Uh, and for those that don't know, audiologists are basically uh, doctors and professionals that deal with uh, patients that have uh, hard of hearing or hearing loss. And they basically go in and do various tests with them. Uh, they might outfit them with hearing aids or other hearing accessories. Uh, they might perform cleanings or checkups and all that sort of thing. Um, I mean, obviously, within our age uh, group and bracket, obviously, we're not quite the demographic for that just uh, just yet. But, um, you know, it's definitely an essential service. Um, Cycle itself is uh, being used by over 20,000 uh, you know, hearing care professionals across North America. We are in Europe a little bit as well, but primarily... Uh, North America is our, our primary uh, market. And basically, we have a platform that deals with most of the major issues that a uh, practitioner might need to deal with. And in this case, we just try to streamline a lot of the flows and issues that they might have to deal with. Um, the one thing to note is sometimes an audiology clinic is a very small clinic. It might just be run by a couple of people. It might be run by the primary doctor and then maybe a couple of staff and then that's it. And then you also you have larger uh, clinics as well. Um, best example I can give you in the real world that makes a little more sense uh, is maybe like an optometrist or a dentist. Uh, you go into their clinic, you have somebody at the front desk who books your appointment and they have your charts and your schedules. They pre present that to the um, maybe the assistant or the doctor themselves. They take you to the back and then, you know, they do the checkup on you, whether it's cleaning or you know, dental work or they're doing eye tests. Uh, very similar with audiology. So Cycle basically handles all the data and all the uh, digital components of this and we're trying to keep everything as digital as possible creating easier quicker workflows for people so that uh, it makes their lives a lot easier and gives them time to really work on the uh, major thing which is dealing with their, with their patients um, so yeah a little bit more about cycle so uh, the products we have we have a, a suite of products uh, one of our most well-known is cycle classic uh, which has been around in the industry for about 20 years uh, one of the newer products that we have is called Cycle Pro, however, and that's kind of a, a modernized update to the classic platform. And this is adding in new features and new things that over the years, uh, patients and clients have been asking for. Uh, so some of the key features include having a resource calendar, having text email appointment reminders, having a to-do center, which is basically like a reminder, having an inventory management system, uh, this is kind of like where you'd see like stock of inventory and how many pieces and serial numbers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, caption call, uh, e-docs, so this is digitalization of documents, uh, e-claims, so this is insurance and other forms, and a whole bunch of other things that uh, I'm not going to bore you with today, but just give you kind of an overview of what uh, Cycle is all about. Um, so getting to sort of, you know, what we are, um, I'm going to kind of try to generalize this as much as possible because a lot of what I'm talking about today applies a lot to basically every tech company uh, within Vancouver and, you know, pretty much anywhere. Uh, so like anyone, you know, we have a product team here, we have engineering, we have QA, call, uh, quality assurance, we have UX, user experience, which I'm a part of, we have our Cycle Classic team, which is its own uh, dedicated team. Uh, and then we also have CE, which is customer experience, and we still have sales as well. Um, so if we actually break it down, uh, just for those who aren't as familiar with what each of these roles actually are. Uh, so product team generally is a very critical uh, organization in the company. Uh, usually they're the ones that define the strategy and the roadmap and feature definition for the product lineup. Uh, so in this case with Cycle Pro, all those little separate things that I just uh, mentioned in previously with like uh, appointments and reminders and documents and stuff, uh, a product uh, person would actually be leading the uh, 
sort of what's behind all that and what are the needs and the requirements, what do customers want, what, is, what are the business needs, and it kind of come together. Um, some product teams are also a little bit more uh, advanced. They deal with uh, p and which is profit and loss. Um, they might do forecasting of, of market. They might do some marketing initiatives themselves. Uh, and in other cases, they might not. It really depends on the organization. Uh, for Cycle, we don't do so much um, of the, the latter here with the market and forecasting and all that kind of stuff. We deal more specifically with just the actual um, you know, requirements and definitions of product itself. But just to give you an idea of what the role is about, um, moving into engineering, uh, engineering is obviously very technical. Uh, it's composed of developers and um, managers who code both front end and back end. Um, they usually work off the requirements that are given to them by product. Uh, so obviously the more clear those guidelines are, the more straightforward and uh, better understanding there are, uh, you know, it's easier for them to do their jobs as well. Um, also with this, uh, the, the tech leads or the managers are then able to inform product and uh, upper management in terms of how long some of these things uh, take. So one thing to note is at Cycle, we uh, work in an agile development uh, setting. And for those who don't know, Agile is just basically a, a type of work method where you're working in short iterations. So you might have anywhere from a week, two weeks, to a month uh, sprint, where you define a certain uh, amount of work to be done, you identify problems, outcomes, and you have the whole team working around that to define those issues, basically uh, you know, work to create solutions for them, and then revisit and then iterate upon that really quickly uh, until it goes to the next, uh, next round. And like I said, depending on the product and company size, sometimes those are really short uh, timelines and sometimes they're quite a bit longer uh, as well. It's also gonna vary between, uh, you know, currently the industry that I'm in right now, which is uh, more of a SaaS uh, market or an enterprise product versus say something for gaming or something for television, uh, very different uh, timelines and, and product uh, sort of requirements go through there as well. Uh, but yeah, let's just to give you an idea of that. Um, moving along, QA, quality assurance. Uh, so we have a whole team of engineers here that are dedicated to just facilitating testing and making sure that all those edge cases are taken care of. QA is definitely a critical part of any uh, development team just because you really need to make sure that uh, the work that you're creating is usable, it works, it does what it's supposed to, and uh, you account for all these edge cases that you might have. Um, what if somebody, <coughs> excuse me, what if somebody does this? What if someone does that? Uh, what happens in this situation? QA is usually the ones to do this. Um, they work off the user requirements and often there are bugs and other issues that they raise and then hopefully, um, you know, those are uh, brought back and fixed. Uh, moving along, UX, uh, user experience, uh, so that's myself. So we actually uh, in this case, also as researchers, some of the larger, the larger uh, tech companies might break off, um, <coughs> excuse me, might break off UX into um, separate different divisions. You might have UX researcher, you might have a UI designer, and then you might have a UX designer as well. Um, we're a little bit smaller, so we don't quite have the uh, flexibility to do that. So our team usually wears multiple hats. So we I do a little bit of everything as well along with my team. So we do researching, we do our own design and development, and then uh, we also do the UX as well. Um, so some of the things that we do and tools we use include Trello, uh, Zero Height for documentation, Envision, Cardboard, uh, Sketch, Zeppelin, and other things, which uh, most of you are probably really familiar with at this point. Um, obviously, we try to gather data and markets and behaviors and all that stuff. We work really closely with product and engineering to ensure uh, information and designs are considered. Um, and again, yeah, a lot of these might vary by uh, company team structure as well. Uh, we also have a CE team, so this is customer experience. Um, and yeah, clearly sales is also a huge part of, uh, of any business uh, that's looking to scale and grow. Uh, in this case, you know, our sales team is often talking to our, our customers and asking them about their experiences and also act as researchers in a lot of way. We siphon a lot of the information from them and reiterate that back in the design phase into product, into engineering. So our, our whole uh, company tries to be very um, you know, fluid in terms of information gathering. We all try to assist each other as any good company should. Um, so definitely awesome, awesome work on their part as well. And yeah, um, moving right into the actual design element um, at Cycle. So our areas of focus specifically for design uh, the different platforms that I had mentioned. Uh, so we have Cycle Classic and, and Cycle Pro. 
predominantly, I, I work with Cycle Pro right now. Um, this is basically where we, our teams have established high value and importance to our customers. Uh, we have something called a patient summary, and this basically includes all the patient information. So, you know, name, address, birthday, any allergies, notes, uh, forms, claims, insurance, whatever you might think of that would be useful for someone uh, to have. This is generally in this section. Uh, so these are the areas of focus. This is a gigantic part of our platform. Uh, it's broken into many different uh, sort of segments, and uh, our design team here, including myself, we work on these pillars and these areas to uh, constantly enhance and solve uh, you know, customer issues and bugs and fixes and all the things that we encounter over our time here. Um, another key element for us at design here at Cycle is that we use the AMP design library. Uh, so for some of you who might not be familiar with that or design libraries in general, um, generally these are open sourced. Uh, some of them are closed, but most of them are open source design patterns and libraries that are available online. Uh, the best example I can give you is something like Google's material design pattern library. Uh, anyone can go basically look up their documentation, download a lot of the assets that they have, and have uh, white papers and guidelines into how to use it. Um, we are using Ant uh, for various reasons, and I'll go over that in uh, you know, further slides in a little while. But for right now, we're, we're using this pattern. Uh, there are multiple others. Um, you know, some companies opt to use uh, pre-existing ones like we have here in this case. Uh, some of them adopt in other companies. Uh, various companies might adopt um, Google's material design. Some of them might adopt IBM. Some of them might adopt other ones. Uh, there's at least six or seven major big ones I can think of right now, but um, you know, most people either do that or if they have the luxury, uh, they might uh, create their own in-house system. And I'll talk a little bit more about the pros and cons of that in, in a little while, but um, there are definitely benefits and, and trade-offs to, to that as well. So um, moving along as well, uh, with any design team and any design uh, element in any company, one of the key things that should be noted is design principles. And really, if a company doesn't have design principles or a foundation of why they're doing design and what it's for, it's generally you know, not a good thing. It's always good to have a, a, a strong foundational aspect of why they're doing design. Uh, so we're looking here, this is basically a pyramid. This is, you can kind of think of this as a pyramid, um, kind of like Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, if any of you are familiar with that principle. Uh, basically in this case, we're looking at these core structures. So the bottom basic thing that we need is we have to understand our users. We really need to know what the basic needs are for them, and we need to make sure that we understand them in some capacity. So we have you know, user personas, we have, uh, Journey, journey mapping and all that uh, to really understand what our users are like. Um, also, we're in a unique position because our users are not always tech savvy young, younger people. Some of them are a little bit uh, you know, older and you know, we can't take for granted anything. So we really need to accommodate for a larger audience as well. Um, some companies, you know, especially the younger tech companies, they, they go for the you know, sexy design stuff because they think that you know, their core market is a little younger and more tech savvy. But uh, in some SaaS enterprise products, you have to consider an even wider audience and more accessible, more inclusive uh, audience. So we're constantly aware of those things as well. Um, we have to also be aware of the psychological needs as well. So what, are, what is wanted, what's required? Um, sometimes it's difficult because people often won't tell you what they want. They'll, they'll think they, they'll tell you what they think that they want, but in reality, sometimes uh, you have to dig a little deeper to find that out. And that, that kind of goes back to the research side, but uh, we'll talk about that a little later. And then lastly uh, is, you know, being finally crafted. So this is just our own sort of um, last little point, little icing on the cake, which is just to have that self-fulfillment to making sure that we are creating delightful, engaging, simple to use experiences as well. Um, so our goals, uh, kind of translate this, yeah, we need to understand users, we are not them. So we have to understand. We have to create structure and hierarchy, uh, you know, make sure this is consistent. That's our priority as a design team. We need to create consistency between interface, language, and patterns. We have to shorten the delivery curve because our customers are broad. We have many, um, you know, many clients using us. As I mentioned when I started, you know, there's 20,000 or more uh, practitioners using our software, but you know, there's even more people beyond that actually using it. So we have to make sure that the, the learning curve of someone coming in is really low and they can pick this up quickly. And it's by that we have to make sure that it's consistent and efficient. Um, you know, we have to leverage technology that drives in, uh, efficiency. So this kind of goes back to what I mentioned with using the Ant uh, design system. Uh, 
Um, we're using this because we're leveraging a pre-existing uh, you know, system. Uh, we're not making our own internally, not, not for the lack of talent or not that we couldn't, but we have to balance um, you know, cost and work of effort right, to get that. And uh, for us, it really wasn't worth the time, energy, and money to create a design system just to say that we have it when we can leverage something else and drive much faster efficiency as well. Um, so yeah, and our last points as well as uh, as I mentioned, you know, we want, we want to make sure that what we do is good. You know, we want to make sure that we're proud of our of, of our work. We want to make sure that we come into the office happy, and you know, we leave each day feeling fairly satisfied with our, our results. And we also want to have fun. So our office here is pretty good. We have uh, play, people playing ping pong. Um, we have a foosball table. Uh, we have a Nintendo Switch. People play uh, games. So you know, not too far off from most tech companies. Um, you know, we're not quite up there in terms of those, some of those finer luxuries. We're not like a Microsoft or an IBM or an Apple, but uh, you know, sometimes uh, people don't always go for those perks and there's other values that I uh, mentioned before with, you know, making sure that you're helping people and, and driving uh, real value to the market instead of uh, looking for superficial things. So, um, so for our part, uh, you know, we're UX led process, uh, it's quite abstract. So we, we always begin with uh, research. So traditionally, if we're presented with a new uh, project to work on, uh, we'll bring in by researching that, trying to figure out what it really is. Uh, this might be something like we're talking to our customers. We might do this with our products. So that's the PD, product department. Uh, we might talk to our sales and customer experience uh, teams as well, again, jointly with our product team. Uh, we'll try to surface insights from research. You know, we'll look through our own database of, of history of clients and see how people are using it, what they like, what they don't like. Uh, we rely on tools like Google Analytics to give us that data-driven decision-making that we really, uh, you know, need. Uh, we have database queries, so, you know, we'll ask our engineers to give us some information from the database and, you know, account for some edge cases. And then we have, uh, you know, we'll impersonate some of our customers. So we'll actually go in and try to uh, re redo the steps of what a, a customer might do using, you know, our journey mapping and some of our personas and just some of our insights to our customers as well. Um, our other UX process is you know, shaped, so we definitely have discussions, you know, like any company uh, with design teams should definitely constantly be having discussions between product, architecture, and development, and front end. Um, so in our case, this is usually what we deal with. Uh, we usually try to define scope, so we try to set those boundaries between what's expected and what we can deliver. And then we might do a rough UI, so kind of like the image here uh, that I'm sharing with you guys. Um, so if you're curious what tool this is this is just using Envision uh, freehand. So basically, just rough doodles and sketches. Uh, sometimes we do this if we have luxury of time, and if it's a, maybe a very complicated thing. Um, sometimes we go right into design. It really just depends on the project. Um, but in most cases, we'll do something like this. Uh, and then we also have our you know our concrete process, which is where we hand over the actual responsibility as well. So we have uh, so we have that shaped idea going from the UX team. So we go from our rough wireframes into more concrete designs. So now we start using our design library and our design systems. We iterate and check in with all these different teams. So as I mentioned, engineering, product, maybe even sales a little bit. Uh, we'll create a prototype and have discussions around that prototype to make sure that it's you know on track and feasible. No point in doing extra work, having an often engineer to make it and then realize it doesn't work when we can do that with a low, uh, low effort uh, fidelity uh, testing uh, prototype. Uh, we'll do internal review tests sometimes with our other members of the team. Um, we try to usually gauge people that maybe don't interact with our software as much. So we might go to our office managers, HR. We might go to some of our other uh, product managers and uh, developers and ask them to do some testing. And then we usually also do executive design reviews. So this is at the most higher uh, senior level management in the company. We'll present our uh, designs and sort of work to them and uh, you know, our CEO and our CEO and our marketing leads are all very involved with this process and they often chime in with really specific uh, insights and feedback from their own experiences. So uh, it's definitely a large amount of discussion that goes on, which is great. Um, you know, our job doesn't really end. We, you know, UX is, is very much a cross team um, role. So we do support QA builds as well. Um, so yeah, we do join those standups. Uh, as I mentioned, we're in Agile, so we do have scrums and standups. Um, 
So we'll join those, we'll join those uh, teams sometimes to help uh, talk through some of those things. We help some uh, help uh, implementation challenges. So if we need to tweak a design, uh, someone found something that doesn't work or just won't be what we need, we'll, we'll go back and fix things. Uh, we always try to design for edge cases, and this is done normally during the design period. Wow. So this can be anything from what happens if customer or client X wants to do a Y Z thing. What do, what does that look like? What does it do? Can it, can our system handle it, etc.? Um, we provide error notification copy, so we try to go in and, and have a very specific uh, language, and this goes back to our consistency and making sure that everything is very much the same. And then we do our own internal QA for UX between the between the team uh, here at Cycle for UX. We look over our own work and make sure that everything is uh, is good. Uh, so design components. So I, I mentioned this design system, this library a couple of times. I mentioned Ant. Um, and I mentioned, you know, why did we go with this instead of making our own? And again, it's not for lack of experience or skill or talent. Um, we just wanted to do this because number one, Ant's system is also designed for enterprise SaaS, so software as a service. Um, it's open source, it's easy to use, it's very well documented, it is updated frequently. It is currently at Ant uh, version 4 right now, uh, previously was at 3. Um, so there's a lot of updates, new icons, new uh, features, new components. Uh, it's platform agnostic, so as I mentioned, there is you know, other, system, other design systems um, out there. There's material design, there's Windows uh, WinUI that just came out not too long ago. Um, but you know, those are very much geared towards very product-specific companies because Google has its own suite of products, Windows obviously has its own. Uh, we're trying to be very you know, platform agnostic. We want to reach the most amount of people as possible. We're not trying to uh, you know, play favorites or anything like that. Um, you know, our component coverage and aesthetics is wide uh, and it covers a lot of it. It is, uh, you know, for the most things that we need, it, it's there. Uh, and it has a built-in responsive framework, which is uh, a big, big deal for us because as anything, our customers, clients are on the go. Uh, they're not always on a, a big desktop computer. Sometimes they're gonna be on a laptop, a tablet, or maybe even a phone. And we need to have a framework that reacts to that quite nicely. So, um, you know, and it does that. Uh, our work is primarily with desktop, but as the world is shifting and changing and, and those numbers are, are changing every single day, we are seeing a, a bigger growth in the mobile sector as well. So this is great that out of the box, it's, uh, it's supported. Um, to give you an example of, of what our design system looks like using Ant, it looks like this. Um, obviously, because, you know, we're, uh, uh, no one's really signing up an NDA or anything, I can't really get into the, the meat and potatoes of what it looks like for you guys. But to give you an idea, it's like this. It's not really crazy in terms of design. Um, you know, there's a lot of different components. We have skeletons, spinners, loaders, drop downs, buttons, tables, cards, all that stuff. Um, so, you know, your imagination can go, I'm pretty sure you can imagine quite easily what it looks like, but this is just a good example of that. Um, I mentioned some tools earlier that we use. So one of, the, one of the tools we use is called Trello. If you haven't heard of it before, it's basically an organization system. Um, it's kind of modeled after uh, the Kaizen method, which became very popular uh, in the late 80s and early 90s at companies uh, like Toyota and Honda in Japan. Actually, they were one of the first ones to implement this kind of idea of um, you know, vertical stacks of work and having that work kind of move side to side or from left to right uh, type of positioning. Uh, it really increased productivity and efficiency and it drove you know, basically the sales of Honda and Toyota through the roof. And you know, because they were able to be so efficient, they could just make so much more than the competitors. And because they were so organized and focused, it let the company as a whole to really see where everyone is going. So Trello is a great tool company-wide to be able to see, hey, here's what we're doing, here's at what stage we're at, here's where the bottlenecks might be. And it really lets you see a clear visibility into um, how the whole company is moving. So uh, we try to use Trello as much as possible. This is our specific UX Trello board. There's, you know, there's other, other uh, ones as well. Uh, but it gives you an idea, you know, we tag ourselves in it. Where there's links, documents, and notes. Uh, integrates with other uh, platforms as well. So you can use it with things like GitHub and uh, Jira and Confluence and other, uh, other platforms too. Uh, another uh, software that we use to help organize ourselves is called Cardboard. Um, it's, uh, or oh, sorry, uh, Dovetail. This is, my, uh, this is my mistake here, sorry. This is Dovetail. Um, this is basically, again, just sort of keeping track of notes and like interviews and feedback and stuff like that. 
Um, Dovetail is still new. It's, it's, we just started using it uh, not that long ago internally. It's actually a very new product in the market as well. I believe it's still in beta, so it's still kind of a little rough around the edges, but it really helps us organize our feedback from customers. And as you can see here, we have a bunch of these that, uh, you know, dots uh, with different colors, um, different clients and customers, you know, interviews that our sales team and customer experience team have with some of our clients and try to drill down and really understand uh, what the issues that they might face and how can we help resolve some of those with design and development and so on. Um, I'm sure you guys are aware of Zeppelin. You guys have probably used it to some degree or at least seen some of it. So Zeppelin's an invaluable tool between developers and designers. We use it quite frequently to help uh, our development team and our front end team understand uh, what we're doing and what our components look like. Uh, and between the documentation between Ant and Zeppelin and other things, we have a really robust system that allows uh, to make sure that everything's super consistent and just really strong in what we do. And yeah, and that's kind of it for me. Um, I think I went over you know, a fair bit of stuff here. I did want to give you guys at least a good amount of time uh, to ask me uh, questions as well and, um, you know, and, and kind of pick my brain about stuff, whether it's cycle specific, uh, product, pipeline, uh, whether you guys have questions about what's it like in the industry or games or anything else, uh, I'm definitely more than happy to answer. Uh, this might be a little um, off topic of cycle, but I'm curious what uh, what, what you did at NFL and uh, in, in, in football. That sounds really, really intriguing. Yeah, for sure. Like I said, I'm, I'm more than happy to share uh, experiences, knowledge and stuff. So, um, so a little more context with that. Um, when I worked on the NFL game, it was through the NFL directly, NFL and the NFL PA. I worked for a company called DNA which is a Japanese publisher, uh, and they make mobile games in Japan. Um, at the time, that company was looking to expand their North, their North American presence. So uh, they actually opened an office here in Vancouver for a number of years. And uh, basically, one of the projects that we had worked on there was a collaboration with the NFL. Um, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with, like, maybe trading card games. Generally, like, you can think of your Pokemon and your Yu-Gi-Oh! and stuff like that. Kind of that mechanic, but on the phone and basically with the NFL. Um, so very similar to what uh, was really popular, at least back when I was a kid, which was the top trading cards. You could, you know, you go to like 7-Eleven or, or something, and you buy a pack of cards and you open it up and you have your, your player cards with your stats and what team they're on and highlights and all that kind of stuff. So we basically took that model and we made a game out of it. And we said, you know, you could play fantasy football, you can make your own custom fantasy teams, you can play leagues and divisions and stuff like that and kind of go through this process. Um, so my responsibility there was I was the art lead of that, of that team. So I designed the initial UI for it and I said, you know, it should look like this. I actually bought a lot of Topps cards at the time and really referenced what they looked like. I watched a lot of, you know, Fox Sports and news and basically anything I could see that was sports related, I just dived in for a couple months and looked at the designs. I looked at transitions, crossfades, animations, and basically made a UI around that that I then presented to my team and said, I need you to you know, kind of replicate this and make these cards. I, you know, we, just, we work with our game designers to actually uh, make this uh, trading card game into an actual game where you, you move through the league, you try to collect players, you trade players, and then you could buy these you know, sort of quote unquote exclusive uh, player cards that were higher stats, better value. You could trade them with your friends. It was all done mobile, it was all done online. Um, it was a great little game for, for a number of years. Unfortunately, that was back in the mid 2010s, so I don't think it's actually on the market now, but it was an interesting experience working with the NFL because we were provided with thousands of photos from players during training camps and in the season, off season, uh, actual game photos. Uh, part of my job was to take those photos and zazz them up and make them look cool, so we had a lot of effects. Basically, we Photoshopped them to make them look really cool. Um, okay. But it was interesting working with a, a large company because they had so many uh, branding and guide restrictions. So, you know, you couldn't tamper with the logos, for example. It had to be certain placements. You couldn't put them on certain backgrounds. Um, I think one time I accidentally Photoshopped in a 
college football field on top of a player that was a professional player and they caught it and they said that uh, one of their um, their leads emailed me back and said hey you're using a college football field and I said Hi, what's the difference and he said oh the yard lines are different and I was like you noticed that and he's like yeah that's, that's what we do so you know they were they were super eagle-eyed in terms of what they wanted and uh, you know we released the game into market it was online for a couple of years did quite well uh, but yeah, unfortunately, it's just, you know, it's kind of, as with most games, especially mobile games, they go through that cycle of, uh, uh, of being live and those campaigns and events happening, and then they kind of die down. You know, they're eventually taken off flying, but uh, definitely really fun. So, Super cool. Yeah, I grew up with cards too, so um, definitely can re uh, relate to a lot of what you were talking about. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was really yeah, fun yeah. working with them. Um, I mean, that whole company's uh, kind of philosophy was around cards. It was a, it's a very popular thing in Japan and Asia, so they really mm -hmm. wanted to kind of capitalize on that here in North America, and they wanted to do with North American properties, and, you know, you can't really get much more North American than you know, football, so that was a great partnership right. with them. Taught me a lot about branding guidelines and structure and organization, uh, managing teams. You know, I had 10, 10 artists underneath me, that reported to me and you know, I had to align them and make sure that everyone worked in sync and unison. Uh, so really great learning experiences, really great working with a, a big profile client like that. And uh, yeah, it was really fun. I've got another question kind of relating to your, um, your gaming experience. Yeah, for sure. Um, because I believe that there's a few of us in class anyways at least that are interested in maybe trying to get into the gaming industry mm -hmm. but we don't necessarily have any experience in the game industry so mm -hmm. just wondering if you have any like insights or uh, tips or anything to expect or prepare to get in yeah, I mean, that's, um, that's a really great question. It's a multifaceted question because uh, I would kind of come back and say it depends what you want to do in the games industry. It, it depends if you want to become an animator, a modeler, a rigger. Do you want to get into design like UX or UI? Do you want to get into motion graphics and, and more of the animation realm? So that's probably the first place I'd say is like defining where you, what, what you want to do as a job role. Um, second is, you know, making sure you really understand what company you want to go to. And I know it's tricky as a student because, you know, obviously you want to get employed and, and, you know, a job's a job. Um, but I say that because you need to really understand where you're going and what they're doing. And that kind of comes back to that research part of just like, you know, looking at what they're doing, how do they do things, what's their market, who are they trying to reach, what are their uh, products and what that look like. And then, um, Really, I would say generally the best thing to do is if you don't, you know, I didn't have any experience in games either, but um, I try to show them things that I thought would be of value to them. So I analyzed and said, okay, you know, they have these games, they have some UI, or they have this interaction. Um, you know, as a designer, as a UX designer, I constantly look at things all the time and think, you know, does this work really well? How would I improve this? You know, what could I do? What would I do if I was tasked with making this? Uh, and try to come come up with things like that. Um, so one of the great things I think to do as a student is to, you know, obviously when you, you're looking to get hired, the best thing that companies want is they want to show, they want to know that when they hire you, you bring value to them. Right? They want to know that they don't have to spend a lot of time just training you and bringing you up to speed on the basics. What they want to know is that you have the right mindset. You can think the way that they are doing things and then they can train you on the tools. The, the tools that they use doesn't matter. Those are things that... Um, you know, basically you can kind of just learn as you go and each company is different. That's the thing I learned as well as I worked at so many different companies and all of their pipelines and all their tools are always different. So uh, irrespective of what you might learn in school, uh, it's going to vary uh, quite greatly with, um, you know, what, uh, what happens out there. But I'd say, yeah, cater your portfolio to the company you want to work for. If you have a favorite in mind, you know, look at them, research them, gear your work towards them. Uh, if you want to be a you know a UX person, it's a lot about research and understanding user needs and understanding those flows. So you might want to put in some journey maps. You know, think of like what would a player who's new to the franchise be looking at? What what are the what is the thought process? Then you might want to think of like you know what would be some of the design flows that you might do? What's the onboarding flow for a new user versus a returning user? What would be a flow for a campaign or a new campaign that's being introduced? It's a lot of work on your end to like do a lot of this, of course, but the more value you can show them up front, I think the more likely that they're looking at you and saying, okay, this person's really great. They have the right mindset. They're hungry. They're, 
you know, ambitious. And those are the things, those are the qualities that they're going to be looking for. Um, as a general rule, I'm also going to say it's just great to update your portfolio quite consistently because I think uh, even when I was an instructor, a lot of my students, when they graduated, they don't really update their portfolios. A lot of the time they would just be done and then they thought, that's it, that's enough. I don't need to do anything. And they just sit at home and play, and play games or something. But the reality is you got to keep at it. Like you got to keep updating, add new stuff, um, rework your old stuff, constantly be improving because there's a lot of competition. There is a lot of people, you know, hungry for work right now. And you got to do every little bit you can to stand out. So uh, that's one side. The other side, I think, is just be social. Like, I know it's kind of hard now with the virus, but, you know, there's a lot of things you can do online. You can reach out to people on LinkedIn. You can connect with them, message them, you know, ask them, uh, you know, if you can do something for them. I don't often say it's a good idea to intern just because, or especially unpaid internships, because I think it does devalue our industry and people should be paid for their work regardless of if they're you know, new students, graduates, whatever. Um, but a lot of companies do have internships that are paid. So I would you know, try to do that route as well, try to get in. Um, another thing as well is sometimes you can not get in with that role that you want. You really want to be a designer, but you just don't have the experience yet but they have an opening for some other role that maybe you could apply for that would fit in more. There's no shame in taking that and then working or you're working your way up to it because once you're inside the company, you can really understand and talk to those people one-on-one. -on -one. And it's much easier to go to somebody and say, here's my portfolio. Can you please have a look at it and tell me what you think on the inside than the outside? So there's a multitude of ways to, to kind of go about that. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers, <laughs> answers some of your questions. Yeah, no, no that was really good insight. Thank you. Um, you spoke earlier about um, choosing a job that makes an impact and um, weighing that versus the, the perks of a bigger company or a company that uh, whose job description might not be all that enticing or, or exciting or mm -hmm. that impactful. I was wondering um, um, what are your personal experiences on that front? Yeah, that's actually really great too. And um, I think the big part of that is it was a learning thing for me. Like I'd, I've been in the industry now uh, about a decade, uh, or just a little bit more than that. And for me, when I started, I didn't, I didn't care about that, you know, that whole thing of like, oh, I want to do projects that have value to the world. I just wanted to work on cool stuff. And there's no shame in that either. But uh, as I got older and, and started to work for these companies, I got less enamored with the idea of like, I'm making a cool shiny thing. And I got more interested in I'm making a cool, good thing that helps a lot of people out. And that became more important to me as I got older and my values changed. Um, and, you know, it, it is a learning experience. A lot of companies uh, have really bright, great advertising on their websites. They got flashy ad campaigns. They have the social media, uh, you know, they say, oh, you know, we're, we're making the world a better place in whatever way. I can't tell you what value that is to you because we're all different and, and, and the thing is subjective. But for me, I just saw a lot of direct-to-consumer companies all kind of spouting similar things. And really, to me, I, I just looked at what they're making. Like, what was the product? You know, at the end of the day, some of these companies were saying, like, we're going to change the world with, like, how we do, uh, you know, beauty products or how we do footwear or this or that. And it's just like at the end of the day, it's like you make shoes and you make lip, lip gloss. Like, if you think that makes the world a better place, all the power to you. But to me, it's that's not what I, I care about. I wanna I wanna do a software that's and that's not to say that it has to be a medical thing. It has to be like a, a hospital or whatever. It could be anything. But I just kind of saw through the marketing and, and and the glitz and glamour and realized a lot of companies preach one thing and then do a different thing. And uh, one of my experiences was with, with a startup. Uh, here in Vancouver, I won't you know name who they were, but um, you know they had a very lofty goal, and they they had all that kind of like oh you know we want to really change the world, we want to help people, but on the outside it was one way, and the inside it was not that way. And you know a lot of I, I felt like a lot of uh, people that were not treated very well, and there was a general cultural shift and a break. And that's another thing I'll say is if you're looking for a job, you know some in your early career, you know it's take what you can get by all means, but as you get more uh, in the industry, you have a couple years underneath your belt. I think culture will become more important to you because having a foosball table or, or a beer tap, all well, that sounds kind of cool. It wears out pretty quick. After a while, you kind of realize that it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, if you work with a bunch of people that are very hostile towards you or, or 
off or aggressive and you don't feel comfortable, you don't feel good about where you are, or you don't feel like you're making a positive difference or a change, then all this stuff doesn't really matter at the end of the day. Um, chasing money is, you know, it sounds cliche, but it's true. You know, I've worked for some companies that paid a lot more than what I made somewhere else, but I just wasn't happy there because, you know, it was, I didn't like the process. You know, some companies were very antiquated and very old and they just had a certain way of doing things that I said, you know, I, that doesn't work with my beliefs and I just don't want to do that. So I just said, you know, no, I don't, I don't want to be here. Um, other companies, again, like I had said, you know, they had this lofty goal and things look great on the outside, but, um, you know, was not really, um, you know, working for me the way I wanted. And I made that call to say, no, this isn't, this isn't for me, but it took me years to get to that point where I could accurately say, I know what I want and I know what I don't want. And that just, you just build that up with, with experience. So there's no shortcut to that. And I think that's part of growth. I think that's great. I think people should go through that and really, you know, figure out what they want, what they like, what works for them, what they value, and then hopefully move in that direction. Well, as someone who um, was a little disillusioned with the corporate business world, uh, I come from a business background and I wanted to come into design and to really intrigued by moral design and, uh, bringing um i feel like user experience we always talk about putting users first but um that's not necessarily always the case it, oftentimes the company's incentives come first and then you you, you package it like you said you market it as user-centric when it's mm -hmm. not necessarily like that um so yeah what what, what you said really resonated with me um I'm wondering, during this job search, how do you gauge whether a company is actually holding up to the values that they claim they have? Sure. Like Glassdoor or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, uh -huh. that's, that's a great point. Uh, yeah, like I said, it all comes back to research and that's part of the great thing about being designer is there's a lot of research. So that, I think that trickles into other everyday things. And really for me, it's, I mean, yeah, Glassdoor is a great insight. I am of the mindset of, I look, when I look at anything as a review, like if I'm looking to purchase like a TV or a phone or something, I, I look at not the great comments, but I look at the bad ones. And I look at the bad ones because I wanna see commonality and I wanna see what, what are the same things people are saying. Because if enough people say the same thing, there's generally some nugget of truth to it. And generally one of the things I look for is, yeah, the negative things. And it sounds a little bit pessimistic, but. Uh, when I look at a company, I say, okay, well, let me research, first of all, who they are. What are their values of the company? Like, what, what, are they, what are the things that they talk about? They say, you know, we doing this or we do that or, you know, we are committed to this or that thing. It's like, okay, that's great. They, they say this stuff. And then I look at their glass door. I look at, like, you know, try to find some nugget of information about what people are saying on the inside. Uh, sometimes you can do that with uh, founders. So if the CEO or the co-founder or whoever is very vocal online and there's usually articles about them or the talk. Um, I'm also a big podcast listener. So I listen to a lot of um, business and like business development to an entrepreneurial podcast. So uh, I listen to a lot of how these companies get started and, and what are their stumbling points and what are the uh, problems that they had. Uh, locally, I found that, you know, a lot of the times, um, it's a combination of research online, it's going to events that they host and actually meeting some of them in person and talking to some of the people there and seeing if I you know, vibe with them in person. Uh, obviously you can't always meet the people you're gonna work with directly, but I'll try and say, hey, you know, um, is the lead person of this company the person I wanna work for? You know, how is their attitude? How do they treat people around them? Even in the social setting, um, you know, sometimes as well, and, you know, and this is just my personal opinion, so don't, don't uh, take it uh, for anything more than that. But so a lot of the time you'll, you'll hear these red flags from companies where they'll say things like, oh, we're all a family here, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. We all do this together or something. And I think to myself, uh, one of the best things I heard from, I believe it was um, the CEO of Netflix, actually. He made a great statement where he said, I don't understand why people say it, you know, a company's like family. He's like, because of family, sometimes you have family members that are not always the best family members. You know, sometimes they have issues and problems and that's human nature. But really what you aim to do is you want to be more like a sports team. You actually want to be more like that because 
in a sports team, you can't have that slack. You know, if someone's not performing, they're going to get cut. And that's what you really want at the end of the day is you want a high performance, high organized, high collaborative uh, company working together, not a company that's willing to accept faults and problems and issues. Some of the way, of course, is given. I mean, we're all human, but like at the end of the day, you want this really great thing. So I think that really resonated with me as well as a lot of companies say, oh, you're treated like family here. Um, things I've learned recently uh, over the last year or two is a lot of the time some companies say, oh, you have unlimited vacation or you have unlimited PTO. Uh, you know, a lot of that times that's just an excuse for them to um, say, well, you know, you can have a vacation, but you might have to work during that vacation. And I have had personal experiences working in companies that have said that, where they've said, you know, yeah, you can go on vacation, but take your laptop with you at work. Uh, and then when, you know, you bring it up to them, they say, well, you know, it's the company or, you know, you and you're not performing high enough. So there's a lot of deep insights. And unfortunately, I can't give you a straight answer as to like how you can find that out. And a lot of it's trial and error. Um, my best advice is to speak with more seasoned people in the industry. If you have a couple friends who've been around for a while, try to ask them and say, hey, what do you think about this company? What do you, what do you know about them? Um, try to go to their meetups, try to go to their events, try to find out information about them and really get into them. But at the end of the day, I would say, you know, look for what the, what the company does, what are their values, do they uphold them? To, is their product actually, you know, what they say it is? And then, you know, make that judgment call yourself and say, do you want to take the plunge and maybe the risk? and go in and you know, learn and maybe not have that great experience or maybe you'll have a great one. Maybe it's not quite what you imagined because you know, maybe it is really good. You know, who, who's to say? So, Super helpful. Thank you, Danny. Does anyone else have any more questions for Daniel? Not at the moment. Um, can we add you to LinkedIn? Yeah, yeah. You, you, um, you guys are definitely more than welcome to find me on LinkedIn. It's just my name, Daniel Sulaji. Um, it's S Z I L E G Y I, a little bit of a, of a long name, but if you even just look up cycle or if you yeah, try to look up my name, um, I should, I should pop up there as well. Um, but yeah, uh, if you guys are wanting to reach out, ask you know, questions down the road, more than happy to, uh, to answer some questions digitally as well. Um, and yeah. I actually have a question for you, Daniel. Ooh, um, sure. This was something that you, we had chatted a little bit about when you, uh, when we had our meeting before this, about working within the confines of a company that's been around for a while and coming in and you were one of the first UX designers at Cycle, right? I believe. Yeah. Um, actually, I wasn't one of the first. I was, uh, I came in, actually, I'm the last member here of the team now currently. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in my other place, I was, a, I was the first designer. Yeah. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Um, maybe could you speak briefly to the kinds of different challenges that you would see in this kind of setting versus if someone was, one of our students was hired at like a startup or somewhere that's very, you know, uh, UX design forward? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's actually a really, really, really good question. Um, yeah, so there's a difference obviously between coming in to something like my current position where I am not the first designer here. There's, uh, I have a lead who has done a fantastic job of, you know, setting up a lot of these great standardizations and structure already so that when I came in here, I didn't need to do that myself and I didn't need to establish that. Uh, she's been really great with like leading the organization and, and getting them to be more design centric. Um, you know, prior to her arrival, I think Cycle was a little bit less design focused, but now with her being here, excuse me, over the last um, little while, it's definitely changed and the mindset has become a lot more different. Um, I can't speak more about the role in terms of like you being the first designer there, right? And it's tough. I've been in that position even with other companies like ADP, for those who are familiar with it, it's the payroll HR company. Uh, if you guys work uh, in probably 90% of the cases, your paycheck will come from them. 
Um, but basically, yeah, so they do payroll services, they do HR management, they do HCM, which is uh, human capital management, which is basically just a fancy way of saying we deal with people and all there is to do with people. So hiring and uh, scheduling and, and whatever. Um, and one of the things there was that's a gigantic organization. Uh, ADP is massive on a global scale. They have multitudes of different offices across different continents, uh, hundreds of thousands of employees, hundreds of thousands of people using their software. So my experience is there at the largest level of an enterprise uh, you know, business company like that was I was coming into a design structure that was created already. I had some leeway into what I could do on an individual project, but I still had to overall focus on what was already given to me. So it's much more like you're following a template uh, that's been designed very specifically and you're just you know, figuring out the, the things around that, uh, around that instead. Um, and it's tricky because even in that setting with it being established, a lot of the senior level executives still didn't really understand what we did. So half of my job was actually educating them and saying, well, no, the design that we're doing is important because of this. And actually going over and showing them that like, you know, here's what you have currently and it looks and works like this. And here's what I'm proposing and this is why it's better. And actually showing them. And once they saw visually what that difference was, they actually fully agreed and were like, oh, wow, this is like, how did we not think of this before? Why did we not do this before? Uh, so they, it, there's also a business case to say, hey, you know what, you are actually saving your time and money. And that's, at the end of the day, that's usually what they care about. So it's, it's great to be able to do that. Um, and, you know, that's a large company, right? So it's a little easier because they have bigger resources and stuff like that. Uh, when I worked in startups, uh, I was, because I had such a, a range of depth in being able to do UI, UX, motion graphics, art design, art direction, I could basically go in and be a full one-man army and say, okay, I'm going to set up everything that you need to have. I'm going to set up these pipelines and these procedures and this guide and these stylings. And it's a lot of work as a one-person team because you have to basically be very disciplined and focused and you have to uh, aggregate your time and, and separate it. I lived and died by a calendar at that point where I was like, I'm going to schedule two hours for this, an hour for this, three hours for that. I have to talk to developers. I have to work on this. I need to talk to product. I got to talk to the CEO. I got to, it's a lot of back and forth. Um, and it's also establishing again, that design culture because a lot of the times CEOs or co-founders are not necessarily design focused and they don't really understand what that is and they don't really care. And that's really not actually part of their business anyway. Um, but, you know, my value to them would be, hey, you know, here's what we're going to do. This is why we're doing it. This is why it works. And this is why it won't work if we don't do it this way. And basically that, you know, is, is kind of what you do. Um, so kind of like a lot of what I talked about in the, um, in the slide deck, uh, that efficiency and that sort of structure, those are really important when you get into that situation. You really need to have that mindset ready to go where you're saying, okay, uh, you guys are inefficient because you don't have these processes. You don't have this, you know, you don't have a design system. You don't have a design library. If your developers are making everything from scratch every single time, that's a really efficient use of their time and efforts. You could probably, you know, uh, condense it and make it work a lot simpler with uh, different things. So that comes with experience. You know, once you've been in that boat a couple times, it becomes easier. But the first time is definitely very intimidating and you have to really be on your feet and yeah there was a lot of long hours worked it's a lot of stress and it wasn't easy but uh i would say that you know i was i was very happy because i can claim a large chunk of that ownership onto myself and say yeah i drove a lot of that uh you know i drove better practices and that you know again as a ux designer that is my goal is i'm trying to drive efficiency and value to not just my team but also the organization and i try to reinforce that design centric culture wherever i go and say you know you need these uh, I try to introduce tools and efficiencies across pipelines wherever I go. It's not just about the design. It's about product. It's about engineering. Uh, you know, I'm not a programmer myself, but I know enough to know what they usually have problems with. So I can speak to that when I go into a company that maybe isn't as mature in their design uh, culture as well. And there's a lot of very uh, mature uh, companies that have great design uh, culture aesthetics and ones that are not as much. So I think it's also on you as a, as an individual and as a designer going into some of these companies to uphold those values and make sure that it's heard. And it's not going to be the first time you're going to have to fight that battle consistently, consistently over and over again, where you're saying, you know, do this, think about this, don't forget this. And you might have to remind multiple different people over and over again that this is important. And that's where standardization documentation comes in where you have, 
uh, document, uh, for example, in Recycle, we have something called zero height, which we use to document all our decision making when we say all our drop downs look like this, and this is why. Uh, if there's a drop down with an icon, if there's a drop down with multi select, if there is a card, expandable card, card with icon, card with button, why, how, you know, what are all the ins and outs of, of the fine tuning of this? And if anyone has questions, that's usually what they should refer to first. If they don't have an answer, then they can come to us directly and say, okay, well, I'm having trouble with this. What do I do? Or what should I do here? What's a good example? And then if they can't find something on, say, Zeppelin, they can ask us and we'll usually help them out at that point. Awesome. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, okay, so I'd say we have time for one, maybe one more question if anyone has anything burning to ask before we wrap up. Going once. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Little boy. <laughs> um, okay, great. I think we will we will wrap up then. Daniel, thank you so much for your time. Thank um, you guys. Really appreciate having you. Yeah, and um, yeah, we'll speak soon. And everyone, feel free to reach out to Daniel. He's a wealth of information. <laughs> Yeah, again, like I said, reach out wherever you can. Uh, and then, yeah, thank you again so much for, for having me and taking the time to uh, you know, having me talk with you guys and share information. Hopefully this is helpful. And yeah, stay safe, stay healthy, and hopefully see you guys around at some point. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Bye. Awesome. Thank Bye. you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. See ya. Bye. 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 <laughs> you want to say bye? <laughs>